Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs ACT branch and our panel discussion tonight on how can Australia use its tools of statecraft in international engagement. I'd like to bring my begin my introductions by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, uh, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. I pay my respects to elders past, present, <coughs> excuse me, and I'd like to extend that respect to any First Nations uh, people who might be joining us tonight. So my name is Amelia Young. I'm one of the council members of the ACT branch. It's my delight to introduce tonight's panel. So we have Melissa Conley-Tyler, William Laban, and Brady Rice. Melissa is the executive director of the Asia Pacific Development Diplomacy and Defense Dialogue. She has extensive uh, experience establishing and sustaining Australia-Asia engagement through track two dialogues involving government officials, academics, media, uh, and business. She is a lawyer and specialist in conflict resolution, including negotiation and business. Uh, sorry, negotiation, mediation, and peace education. For 13 years, she served as the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. She is also an A. AAA fellow. Uh, Melissa joined the University of Melbourne in 2019 as a Director of Diplomacy at AsiaLink, and then as a research fellow uh, and associate in the Australia Institute. Most recently, she was a visiting fellow in the Taiwan Ministry of Defence Think Tank, uh, the Institute of Defence and National Security Research. Uh, William Levin is a Senior Research Officer at the National Security College. His research interests are broad and include climate change and security in Australia's new region, Australian defence and foreign policy, and the future of war fighting. He was previously an analyst in the Climate and Security Policy Centre at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. He's also served in a number of regimental appointments as the Australian Armistice Officer and deployed on operations in Iraq. He holds an MPhil in Development Studies from Oxford, uh, completed as a 2019 John Monash Foundation Scholar. And thirdly, we have Bridey Rice. Bridey Rice is an international development expert with a background in government, non-governmental organizations, the private sector, and public policy. Bridey's main expertise is in Australian and US development policy and future trends impacting the Indo-Pacific development. Bridey has previously overseen Australian bilateral legal cooperation programs as the director of the Australian Attorney General's Department. She also ran public sector consulting as a senior manager for Ernst & Young and represented Australia's leading NGOs to government as a director of the Australian Council of International Development. Tonight's panel will be discussing how Australia can use its tools of statecraft in international engagement. Policymakers have increasingly spoken of the need to use all of the tools of statecraft in Australia's international engagement. The idea has taken hold that in difficult and contested times, we all need the different elements that connect Australia to the world to be pushed in the same direction. No one doubts the scale of international challenges. Australia is one country among many, but the multiplying effects of having different instruments working in concert means Australia can do more with relatively less. Mm -hmm. so, over the next half hour, so panelists will outline Australia's tools of statecraft um, and outline a strategy for encouraging policy areas of defence, foreign affairs, development, trade, immigration, education, energy, as well as other areas and how they can work together to contribute to Australia's capacity to influence the world around that. And with that, I'll introduce Melissa. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Well, I think a talk is always fun when it starts with a mystery. So I think our mystery is all tools of statecraft. What is that? Where did it come from? And what does it mean? So those of you who, um, like us, read policy papers, look at the federal budget, look at the recent Defence Strategic Review, uh, wade through speeches by ministers, may have seen these mysterious words coming up more and more all tools of statecraft, all elements of statecraft, all elements of national power, a whole range. And um, if I was in the mood, I could give you essentially a bingo card of um, uh, Minister Wong saying we need an investment in all elements of our national power. 
uh, Minister Miles saying that a stronger defence force must work hand in glove with enhanced diplomacy, intelligence, economic statecraft and development assistance. I can see Minister Conroy talking about using all the elements of state power or Prime Minister Albanese talking about committing to a whole of nation effort, investing in our capability, strengthening our deterrence and our diplomacy and bringing our presence to the region. And if you look at something like the Defence Strategic Review, it has a whole chapter on all tools of statecraft. The federal budget says that we have to invest in all elements of our statecraft. Um, Across the board, this is coming into the debate. And the question then you ask is why? Why is this coming into the debate? What does it mean? And how did it happen? So I might start with a how did we get here, if I can. Um, so we're all here from an organization called EP4D. And I put papers out so you can see it. The Asia Pacific Development Diplomacy and Defense Dialogue. It was established by Bridie a couple of years ago. Um, on the basis that um, in a difficult and contested world, you need all the national assets, all the elements of state power working together. And so it's made up of people from across the different sectors who understand that and who advocate on it. Uh, it's very much a tripartite initiative. So uh, we are funded from Department of Defence through Australian Civil Military Centre, uh, through Department of Foreign Affairs, through Office of the Pacific and through Southeast Asian Maritime. And then we're housed at the Australian Council for International Development as you know, one of the key bodies for the development sector. So in that sense, it's the sectors absolutely getting together. And the concept that, they've been, that we've been pushing is this idea of statecraft, as in Australia's interactions with the world, being shaped by a variety of tools which all need to be respected and resourced and need to work in a coordinated fashion. So at least from my side, um, in a very short period of time, we found this language really being taken up. And if you think of it, I, I mean, it, it, makes, it makes sense. You know, we all understand we're in a difficult time. Um, you might call that a contested strategic environment. You might call it compounding challenges. <laughs> You might call it the poly crisis, you know, whatever you want to call it. I think we're very conscious that this is not a status quo easy time for Australian foreign policy. But do we have lots more resources to throw at foreign policy issues? No. In fact, if anything, our resources are going down. Um, if you think about all the other countries in the region, our relative power is going down and will continue to go down as countries around us grow. So if you're faced with compounding challenges, static or lessening resources, what are your options? Doing more with less, getting the different assets, the different elements of state power working together more. So I think that's the reasoning and that's why people have really taken this on. Um, I have to say, I don't think I found anyone who's arguing against us in the sense of, no, no, we should have all of our elements of state power working at cross purposes. I mean, nobody makes that argument. But the really interesting thing becomes then, how do you do it? So what we did after our good first year, where we had you know, promoted this all tools approach and we started to see a lot of people taking it on as an idea, is we really focused on the implementation. You know, what does it look like to actually implement an all tools approach. If we agree that that's worth doing, how do you make it happen? And so using very much the AP4D um, process, we brought together experts from across the sectors from defence, diplomacy and development, and we are all representing those, uh, plus the things that don't start with D, like economics and trade and law and law enforcement. We put all of those together in that, that wide idea of what the sectors are. And uh, we ran a consultation process over the course of, I think it was five months, to try to really get down to what does it look like to do all tools and practice, not just to say we're going to do it, but to do it. So um, with a drum roll, you have it in front of you. Uh, in here, and it may, may not surprise, but um, one of the first things we thought was very important was to actually elucidate what we mean by the tools. 
So when we mean, say all tools, we mean all the tools. We have a very long <laughs> list of all of the ways that Australia can try to influence the world around. Um, it starts with what's the basis of your national power that moves into what are your assets and capabilities. And then there are tools in the sense that you can deploy them. Um, now, some people don't like tools language. I suspect we're probably going to end up with all elements of state craft as being the language that most people use. But it's somewhere in there, all levers of national power, all tools, all elements. Um, so we first of all do that just so we're really clear on what we're talking about when we're talking about all tools. The next thing we do in here, and I suppose it makes sense for an organisation that calls itself 4D, we came up with a 4S approach that if you are trying to get all your tools working together, there's four levels you've got to work. The top level is the strategy level where you need an overarching strategy that the different parts of the apparatus can all align behind. And if you don't have that, that's when they are going to be working across purposes. The next level is the structure level where you need um, the different, uh, you, need, you need some mechanisms for different tools to talk to each other, to coordinate, to have some way of communicating. We then talk about staff level. And what we mean there is essentially the cross-cultural skills. So, you know, I've had someone in AFP say, oh, it's so hard. You know, I have to be able to talk to fence and do that, you know, if I want to get anything done. And that sense of being able to work across different parts of government, that's where you need those sort of staff skills. And then the last one is thinking broader in terms of the whole society. If this is not just whole of government, but it's whole of nation, there's a whole range of these tools that I mentioned which are not under government control and which quite precisely get their benefit from not being under government control. Mm -hmm. So things like, I don't know, the Australian Human Rights Commission's work in the region, you know, that is valuable precisely because of independence and there's a whole range like that. Uh, international broadcasting would be another example where it gets its power in that way. So the question then becomes, how do you how do you link with or leverage those assets which are not under government control in a way that helps achieve your overarching objectives? So that is my very quick books tour. All tools, there's a whole range. How do you get them to work together? Four levels. And to help us go into much more detail, uh, I brought along two of our working group members who were so involved in the discussion. As you've heard, amazing people coming from a development and from a defence background. Um, I might just start with, you know, a simple one if I can. I mean, I've seen some of the things I found interesting and I'd like the audience to take away. Think about with you, Bridie. I mean, what's, what do you think is in the paper that this audience needs to know and take away? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the interesting things when you bring together three separate communities or with very different ideas into a working group and you, you say to them, hey, we've got to come up with a paper um, and we have to solve this mystery of when our parliamentarians are now saying all tools of statecraft, what that might mean, is that you very, very quickly start to unpack what's in people's imagination. And one of the cool things in this paper, I think, is that we we're able to get beyond this old tools of statecraft and actually try and differentiate what it might look like to get them working together. But in people's imagination, first and foremost, the moments our nation come together on all tools of statecraft, guess what they were thinking of? Ramsey and Solomon Islands, Australia in Timor, these these spaces where suddenly we were responding and Australia is such a good responder in a crisis and we were able to integrate those tools of statecraft under a unified strategy. So in this paper what I really like is that it sets out on page 10 three ways to think about all tools of statecraft and how we coordinate them and at the pinnacle is that full integration. Think we have a unified set of objectives, our defence diplomacy, development and all the other tools are working in this one particular direction. But what we quickly realised was that, that it, those moments are very few and far between. And so in this table, you'll also see that there is a real challenge for our government apparatus, even just to, say, coordinate those tools, perhaps not full integration, a step less. And coordinating tools of statecraft looks more like 
being bloody clear about what it is we're trying to achieve and then being particularly clear about what each tool has to offer. And I think that is a challenge that we're not necessarily always aware of because perhaps one foreign policy person thinks that the only role, I'm sure none of you would think this, but the only role of the Australian foreign policy establishment is to exert influence and combat Chinese influence in the region. Another foreign policy person would think that the only role of Australian foreign policy apparatus is just to foster development and goodwill in the region. These are different and not unifying objectives all the time. So you go from a situation of does all tools of statecraft, when we say it, mean everybody pushing in the one direction, full integration? Does it mean something else, actually, just coordinating our efforts against multiple objectives in our foreign policy apparatus? Or sometimes, does it just mean not tripping over each other? And I think the cool thing about this paper is that it sets out that those three levels of potential coordination and integration of all tools of statecraft. And I think certainly in the conversations that sometimes we're involved with in with foreign policy makers, I think that's sometimes not always understood. It's assumed we're either aiming for full integration or we're simply aiming not to trip over each other. But there's actually a really exciting foreign policy middle for Australia to be exploring in the coming years. Over to you. Um, thanks, Melissa. So, I mean, in the first instance and up front, um, two caveats. The, the first being the usual one that views, of course, don't represent those of any Australian government uh, organisation, defence or otherwise. Uh, and secondly, I'm, I'm very conscious that there, there are often what are quite esteemed people in, in this room, in particular heads of mission and so on. Um, so so my, my comments are very much intended to strike the, the requisite note of humility um, with, with those caveats in mind. Um, I think two things to me are interesting or particularly important in the paper. The, the first is something that Bridie's already picked up on, um, which was how, how prevalent the theme was in, in discussions and in drafting between uh, I guess the unifying force of crises and operational integration um, and how much more difficult um, the experience might be in developing longer term and ongoing policy settings and that kind of being one of the central contrasts. Um, and, and secondly, and, and most interestingly um, to me, um, I think the staff or the people aspect of the paper um, is perhaps its most important element. I think that's kind of solidified in my mind since since we, we published this, which was a few months back now. Um, the paper has a lot to say also about structure, coordinating, coordinating mechanisms and so on. Um, and obviously all of those recommendations are important. Um, but you know, I think there would probably be a lot of people in the room who would agree with the sentiment that despite the kind of no doubt ever present and heroic efforts of many people across different parts of government to integrate, you know, by the nature of the way that we organise and, and potentially even for human reasons, perhaps the tendency is drift towards silos. And also we, we obviously all come from a grounding in a particular expertise or discipline, um, you know, intellectual policy, operational or otherwise. Um, so, so those forces are always going to be present. The one factor that's also always going to be present uh, that people are going to muddle through one way or another. Um, so we probably ought to make sure that the people who are going to have to muddle through those structures are best equipped to do so. Um, this, of course, also reflects the real world priorities across all three sectors. Um, it's no secret that defence is in a um, particularly difficult position in terms of its workforce at the moment. It's trying to grow at the same time as we are, frankly, bleeding people. Um, that's been highlighted out of the Defence Strategic Re Review and the appointment and elevation of a, of a, head of, a new head of personnel. Um, but that is a long-standing issue which has been publicly acknowledged and has been something that, that has been a struggle. Um, love it or hate it, the nu nuclear-powered submarine task force is going to require um, a gargantuan amount of human effort um, and you know, just cognitive horsepower if that thing is going to work. Um, ongoing attempts to reform AGSVA and the clearance system. I mean, we've had legis legislative movement. There's agreement that, that the new positive vetting authority will sit within uh, ASIO. That was uh, announced in, in recent days or recent weeks. Um, but, but that remains an ongoing challenge that we've been talking for a long time about streamlining the clearance system. Mm -hmm. um, that remains a, a critical obstacle to actually allowing the people to move seamlessly and know what they need to know. And that hopefully is in the process of being overcome, but I don't think you could say it's been overcome yet. Uh, 
I, I'm not sure of the particular, uh, or at least not sure with authority and the, the confidence to speak on it, um, the personnel changes out of the, the DFAT capability review. Perhaps somebody in the room might, might be placed to, to comment in Q&A. Um, and obviously more broad than these issues alone, um, but, but the government is involved in um, a, a new concerted effort to bring parts of the consulting workforce back into to the ABS fold. Um, and that has significant implications for staff and workforce and corporate knowledge as well. Mm -hmm. So, so to me, the one of the the really important causes of the paper is is the staff and people element. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I might continue on with the reaction that people have seen, and then I might go back to each of those four levels and talk a bit about how you see them. But as you say, uh, will the you know the paper's been out for a little while now. I mean, what sort of reaction have you seen, and how do you think people are responding? Um, so, I mean, I think in the first instance, you, you're obviously spot on in the sense that, you know, I suppose you'd, you'd say that the paper's riding a wave of supportive sentiment, right? Um, so I think re reaction is is generally positive. I mean, a couple of, I suppose, reflections on what's happened in those few months. The first, that, like you say, is, you know, the language out of the DSR being incredibly strong on... Um, using the language of statecraft, um, repeated use of language around whole of government um, and, and national defence, and most concretely committing to, to a process around national defence strategy. Now that stops the level short of um, what, you know, uh, a bunch of people in the landscape, um, you know, uh, my, my current boss, Rory Medcalf, being one of them advocating for sort of a national security strategy, a still more broad reaching document, but nonetheless, yeah. you know, that, and, and, you know, plenty of people out there who've kind of made the comment that, Arguably, that change to how the planning process occurs is actually more significant than capability decisions, which were not major changes or, or surprising for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say myself, you know, something like the Defence Strategic Review, a key defence document, explicitly DFAT. saying DFAT needs more funding. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a bit of a, a new bridge. To yeah, say. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the second, I suppose, which goes to the DFAT piece, uh, and, and again, for both of you better place to comment than me, but I suppose uh, what to me, I don't know that, I think it would be over-egging it to describe it as, as an unabashedly positive situation, but perhaps a steadying of the ship. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, there's the headline number that does match the increasing de DFAT funding, the headline number being 450 million. Below the headline, it's perhaps a little more complicated in terms of remediation of, of lease arrangements and mm. communication systems and so on, how much of that actually constitutes a boost mm. is perhaps a more complicated discussion. Or well, how much is making up the wrong yes. loss, loss. Yeah. the can't parts of the task. Um, then, yeah, yeah. Um, but but at least the steadying of the ship that does mm. actually match that language about re-elevating re -elevating the place of that organisation. Mm. Um, the, the, other, the only other comment I'd offer on that is, is maybe we all... A sense of caution that, that a... Uh, very strong uh, and talented minister currently leads the portfolio. Yeah. Um, you know, the nature of the institutional arrangements, I dare say, will probably be more in evidence in the fullness of time when perhaps that's not always the case. And we'll see. Um, right. Mm. Yeah. Certainly from the development perspective, I think we've seen a couple of things shifting of late. Um, I think we've come out of a sort of five to 10 year period where development increasingly um, was seen as less relevant as a central tool of foreign policy. Um, I think that was evident through various funding cuts, various ministerial choices, various decisions within the department, um, not to ne necessarily elevate that expertise. Um, and I think we're seeing a bit of a shift in that now. So I think there's something about this recognition of the idea that there are multiple tools or multiple elements of, of power that need to be mobilised that has put development firmly back on the agenda. Um, clearly issues as they're playing out in the Pacific have helped the relevance case for development. So I think that that's been quite a pro and, and similarly in, in the development policy settings, you're seeing a lot more talk of whole of government, you're, talk, you're hearing a lot more talk of harnessing diplomacy for development outcomes and that sort of integrationist type mm -hmm. thinking. So I think that's been good. Um, I think the, the task now is that what, from the development perspective, is what does it mean for development to be a central tool or a central element of statecraft? And I think you're seeing sort of a fracturing of approaches on this. Um, 
there's one very, very instrumentalist approach that is, you know, it's a bucket of money to be used to leverage influence and, and power. And, and those of you in the audience with a, a strong IR background will, will find that sort of influence discussion very native. Um, but the alternative concern that I'm hearing in the development community is, is whilst we're really happy that development is now considered to be perhaps a little bit more relevant, a little bit more central um, to the discussion about all tools of statecraft, if you don't invest well in your development program capability is delivery in the region, then you won't actually achieve the sorts of long-term outcomes that serve Australia's national interests in a prosperous region, in a stable region and all the rest of it. So I think the task since it's come out, on the one hand, there's this sort of recognition that it's great now to have senior leadership talking squarely about development as a central component, but an element of our power in the region. Um, but there is a there's a little bit of a concern that for some senior leaders um, that also equates an extra bucket of money um, to spend on a, on a much more narrowed uh, version of national interest than I think this paper would propose. So I think there's a bit of interesting work to be done there. Yeah, and I think in a lot of ways that shows to me why you need this 4S framework, that if we're just saying it as an idea, all tools work together, but you don't actually think through how do you make that happen, it can go terribly wrong. And the first level we've said is strategy. You have to have an agreement what this strategy is about. And you gave a good example of how, you know, different people in the foreign policy community might have completely different ideas of what our strategy is mm -hmm. it should be. Um, I'm interested, do you, do you think we're moving in the right direction on this? I mean, as you say, we'll, we're, we're at least going to have a regular defence process. Will that become a de facto multi-whole of government one? Um, we're still waiting for the international development policy to come out, for example. Um, so we're certainly not at the point where, you know, somewhere like the United Kingdom has an integrated <laughs> review where it brings together development, diplomacy, mm -hmm. defence and trade and has a single planning process. But do you think we're getting any more integration in the planning process? In the, um, I think you're getting microcosms of integration. So I mm -hmm. think you could expect, for example, um, under a new development policy, that the planning process absolutely will have a whole of government component to it. Our posts are operating in mini microcosms of all tools of statecraft with a strong ambassador in place. They are making sure this happens in practice, um, not everywhere. Okay, so I think you're seeing microcosms of it. Um, I think at that strategic level, you know, there is that big question about how old is our foreign policy white paper? Um, do we or should we have a unifying Indo Pacific strategy? Why is it that we're getting an economic strategy for Southeast Asia that doesn't sound very all toolsy? Um, so I think that um, we're not there yet. And, and the skeptic in me um, heard somebody describe it the other day as we're saying all tools of statecraft and then we're just sprinkling fairy dust up for the challenge, <laughs> right? And I, and I feel like that's not too far from the truth. Um, but I do think we're seeing a, a better recognition and that's the first start to changing practice. People are using different language. They're, they're looking to integrate things a little bit. I'm actually a bit sus, to be honest. I think it's utopian to believe that you're going to have this magical strategic moment where Australia says, this is what we're after. And henceforth, we shall all marshal our assets in this direction. The best coordination and the best integration of these tools I see happen when our agencies come together and solve practical problems. Um, mm. So I don't think we should underestimate the power of thinking country by country, strategically, project by project, challenge by challenge, to build that muscle in our people um, to be to be working cooperatively. Mm, that's it. I think one of the things in the paper is we do look at international examples. And so you can see, you know, the UK one is a good example, but they had a very clear idea of what global briefing was supposed to be. Or we look at Japan in there, you know, the way that Japan focused on its free and open Indo-Pacific concept and pushed that across a number of, you know, different arms of statecraft as it were. So I, I'm not giving up on it, but I think I accept you're not where you're fairy at. Dust. I think we can we can probably do better, but at the moment it may be fairy dust. What do you think? Um, so, I mean, I think it depends on, on what level you're talking about this operating at, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, between between this happening in a de facto sense or it being institutionalised and explicitly articulated yeah. and whether we're talking about it happening at the level of, you know, the peak decision-making bodies that are, of course, political like NSC and the working level that's developing on mm -hmm. policy, right? So 
I mean, sitting down preparing for this, you know, I was kind of ticking through what what really has has been sort of notable, what have been notable developments and developments in the last six months, right? Yeah. And and that in a, in a very loosely coupled sense, and in the most macro sense, clearly the government is using all of its tools. Um, you know, we we have sort of reinvigorated talk about a comprehensive agreement with with India. Um, you know, the the government, uh, whether it's in an ongoing sense, but but you know, turned the Office of National Intelligence to to, to the climate problem. Um, Home Affairs continues to do a bunch of resilience work and is now at least nominally looking at some sort of democratic resilience work. Um, EU trade negotiations as well uh, improved, but but you know there's a way to go on climate and energy policy and so on. So those levers are being pulled. Would you actually say that they are sort of working to a joined up end in a way that is most efficient? Maybe that would be generous and utopian. Mm. Um, so I think that there's a generous reading of what's happened over the last six months. Are we in any way towards kind of formal institutionalization and articulation? Mm. Clearly not at this point. Mm -hmm. but, and of course, we don't know how long some things will last. So, I mean, what I'm conscious of is having the Minister for International Development being part of key decisions in national security. Um, and you know, that's something that, say, the US has done, uh, you know, putting USAID in. Now, we have that for the moment. Is it institutionalised? Will it continue? I mean, what's your take? Do you think that sort of change in the structures is actually helping? Mm, I think the development community, you know, welcomed um, Pat Conroy's appointment on the NSC. I think we were a little bit conveniently quiet on why he may be appointed and whether or not it was more to do with his other portfolio, which is, of course, looking after defence industry. Um, I think it's a, it, it seems like a no-brainer, and I would say that, to have your development minister and, and serious development expertise and regional expertise on your national security um, committee. I also think it would be a no-brainer to have a secretariat that was thinking a lot more broadly about security. Um, but I think you're right. I think that's a potentially a lucky coincidence rather than a deliberate decision to integrate development into that. I think I'd be just as interested in, in sort of exploring what the other machinery of government pieces might be mm -hmm. out there. Um, for a while, there was a committee that was looking across government on, on a whole of government approach in Australia's relationships with lower and middle income countries. That would be interesting. There's been talk of better integration and reinvigoration of the governance arrangements inside of DFAT as that coordinating entity um, across, you know, various aspects. So I think there's a lot to explore there, um, but I also kind of respect the government in not not making a knee-jerk reaction in trying to get a new policy and a new apparatus and everything up. I think there's enough reviews going on around town that I'm sure many of you are part of um, that I'd be, I'd be sort of advocating for a let's pause, let's soak it in, let's have a think, and then let's pick the areas of momentum where all of our elements of national power um, have the most, you know, convergent interests, things like climate change, things like cyber and tech. Um, things like sort of human security, um, perhaps less than, say, livelihoods in the region. Well, you both talked a bit about some of the changes at the staff level in terms of culture and the, the way that um, this is improving. I mean, uh, we made a number of recommendations in here. Probably the most controversial was to have, you know, a single international policy grad program, for example, or try and move people around more on secondments, et cetera. I mean, if you're going to choose something that you think would actually change the culture and make it easier to work across a government, what would you what would you pick? I'd fix the clearance system. Yeah. Actually fix the clearance system. Yeah. That's the one that stops it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well. And not not just in terms of fixing the clearance system, in terms of getting people clearances, but also this is a much deeper issue, which I'm sure lots of people will have have scars on in the room, but but not over classifying information. Mm. Um, mm. Most stuff was not particularly secret. Mm. Yeah. I'd probably tackle the the culture of contestability that we have in Canberra. I don't know if it happens to you both as well. We're all in think tanks, but. Increasingly, I'm finding that the, the most valuable thing we can do as a constructive partner to government on foreign policy and development is facilitate tough conversations where multiple perspectives are put on the table, which is, I, I feel like, is the, the secret unwritten thing here. Um, and I'm not always convinced that our, um, our public policy officials at the moment have the time. You know, they're super, super busy, super pressured. 
um, to really realise how differently all of our apparatus are, are pulling in very, very different directions. So I'd be looking at that sort of contestability piece. How do you get our public servants accessing different information, asking do we have strategic clarity here, seeking out the insights of, of other people and making those sorts of decisions in a contestable environment rather than just in a, a top-down or a fear-driven or a risk-driven environment at all. I think that there's a muscle across it. And I mean, I'm not the only one saying this. APSC Review said it as well. There's a public policy muscle that I think Australia is going to be demanded to be a hell of a lot more imaginative, nimble, deal with a hell of a lot more complexity in the next five or 10 years. I'd be investing in growing that muscle big time right now. Okay, I mean, to finish up just on that last level on the society, how do you get that whole of nation buy-in? Um, I feel I'm seeing that sort of wording, the whole of nation, much more. Um, the Prime Minister in particular has been using it and, and, and other, other people. And um, I, I mean, if whole of government is hard enough, whole of nation feels a whole nother step. Um, what, what's your feeling there on some of the things we might see moving to? Thank you. Oh, I need time. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, look, that's obviously an incredibly difficult question. Um, the the, the cop-out, which I'll then give some specific examples of, you know, I think cl clearly these things need to be an honest conversation with the public. Um, the concrete example that comes to mind um, is the climate one. Mm -hmm. um, now, clearly the, the, the argument was lost about the, the release of uh, some some unclassified version of ONI's work mm -hmm. um, on its impact assessment. Um, I think that ship has probably sailed. Um, that could always be changed, but you know, the, actually using those documents to have a conversation with the public um, mm -hmm. that yes, in certain quarters will still be perceived as alarmist, but but is not on the evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and having that same conversation, including on the limits of our own power. Mm -hmm. um, particularly in the background, you know, the, the area I come from, from a defence point of view, um, that, that, you know, there are difficult trade-offs um, that our place in the world, you know, I risk getting on a soapbox at this point, but, you know, the, the kind of tired narrative around punching above our weight and so on, you know, that is not helpful. That is not an honest conversation about, you know, the decline of, of our power in relative terms in at least some areas and so on. So, I mean, it's a cop-out answer, but Sorry. But you'd see part of getting that buy-in is having an honest conversation with society as a whole about what our objectives are, what our assets are, etc. Yeah. I think I'd probably look, be looking to shore up what I see as quite a unique opportunity for Australians and their leaders at the moment, which is we have a strong foreign policy minister who's actually prepared to front the media, speak out, establish the relevance of Australia in the world, um, to borrow from the absolutely awesome Alan Gingell um, rule book there um, and I think there's got to be a moment where we actually say it's okay as Australians to talk foreign policy think foreign policy so institutions like AIIA institutions like all the extraordinary NGOs that we have and, and I know we've got somebody from ACWID here today um, the peak body there mobilizing uh, those Australians who do give a damn um, about foreign policy into their MPs I think there's got to be something that we all need to be thinking about. Um, but I don't know quite how you institutionalise. That would be the challenge that I would be looking to tackle. How do we shore up that Australians care about our region and how Australia operates in the region? Um, clearly, there's a, a really interesting diaspora opportunity there. Um, and with the shifts in our demographics, um, that I'd be sort of looking towards a couple of solutions around um, how we make sure that that it stays on the minds of Australians. Mm. Yeah, and I think giving AWA as an example of this is, is a great one. I mean, if you think of AWA membership all around the country, it's made up of people who care about engaging internationally and they might do that professionally. It's business people, it's academics, it's schools. Um, they might do it individually, you know, through their, their charitable work or with NGOs or, um, you know, there are so many ways that individual citizens are part of this as well. And if you're trying to get that whole big sweep of whole of nation, you've got to somehow get from the big strategy level of government all the way through to how do how does my actions as an individual um, potentially enhance what it is Australia is trying to do in the world, the mission we have. I, I might I might get one brief plug in, uh, Rory, would you please with me for, for the NSC on on this 
in the, the you know an, another avenue on this which NSC is now involved in um is the parliament mm -hmm. um and and it, what, what they call NS23 now exists not something I'm personally involved in but effectively briefings for parliamentarians and obviously ministers are incredibly well enabled but you know across the spectrum um right to the back of the benches um which again is you know these are people who lead the conversation um and a lot of them don't have backgrounds in any of this stuff um so enabling them to even use the same language and kind of understand the complexity of some of the issues that they might be talking to constituents or be talking about on the floor uh, of the chambers and so on. That's an important part of this, right? An NSC plug, but one that I think is relevant. Okay. Well, I, I think that's our attempt to give you the flavour, and you have a copy. You can also get a copy online. You know, if you want to open yeah, us up the first. We're going to open the floor for questions, but I thought I'd start with one first. Um, we'll also be taking some from online. So, if you are watching from online, please use the Q&A function that's there. Um, I'll start with a question for whoever would like to take it. Uh, we were talking about the four levels of statecraft, um, and the first of which was strategy. Mm -hmm. um, this point discussed the need to have an organizing bureaucratic entity, perhaps um, with a clear mandate and long-term planning, some form of objective setting. What are some ways that you would suggest um, that we can improve this long-term holistic uh, planning, even if we change governments or change direction um, over time? Mm. And that is part of the, the difficulty, isn't it? Um, look, I think different people on the group had different ideas of what that might look like. Um, I quite like the UK integrated review. Other people in the group do not like that. They, they look at the US model. Um, I think one of the things we do in here is we're quite agnostic mm -hmm. about the best way to achieve some of these results. It has to work in Australia's political system and for our political class. There are a range of ways of achieving it but you have to decide that it's an objective and then choose a way to put that into action. So um, I'm, I'm realistic enough to think that if what we're going to get from the Defence Strategic Review is a regular strategic update thing, maybe we try to turn that into an overarching strategy. It's not ideal, but it might be better than what we have. I'd probably be looking at um, rejigging the operations of NSC. So what gets on the agenda? Why? How should that be chaired? And what you know, really good analysis. Sorry, my son just yawned as I was speaking. Um, really good analysis. Kuda, it happens all the time at home too. Um, really good analysis around what gets on that NSC agenda. I think it's yeah, is one. Um, I'd be looking at where is the the kind of longer term threat assessment across something like a all tools of statecraft paradigm. I think our defence forces are really good at doing threat assessments. We're less so good at, for example, the threats of a lack of, you know, a democratic governance or the threats of underdevelopment. Um, and then I'd have to be thinking about, um, I spent three months on a Fulbright in the think tank community in DC last year. I was absolutely shocked, um, you know, challenges of the US policy and politics aside. I was shocked to come back. I was shocked to realise just how thin our intellectual ecosystem is on foreign policy in Australia. And I know coming from a, running a think tank, of course, I'd say more money for think tanks. It's very predictable. But I do see a really important need for people like yourselves, people like us, um, to be doing some serious thinking alongside government on this. And I don't, I don't see that ecosystem really growing and thriving outside of the security sector. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd probably be advocating for a little bit more thought around what is the ecosystem we need to be ready for the future to face? Because it isn't just government. Um, there's there's other apparatus as well. Uh, I mean, I, I think one that's in there is you know, the, the the paper includes the the far from novel. Uh, possibility of a renewed national security advisor type appointment um you know I kind of have mixed feelings about that and I know a lot of people do and whether or not it works with the you know a Westminster system and um the NSC um rather than a system like the US uh, I think there are open questions about whether it really just kind of shifts the target um given that the ministers remain rightly supreme um so I think that kind of has an allure for people but I'm not sure that it really actually fixes the problem um I think and again things things that I would say coming from my background I mean I think one of defense's strengths and perhaps why it has dominated certain conversations um 
there is the reality of just how much capacity defense has in human terms and in money terms. But what goes with that is, you know, defense plans like no other organization. Like we, you know, plan early, plan 17 times, um, you know, scenario development, um, branches, sequels, like it's what the entire leadership class of the organization mm -hmm. essentially exists to do. Um, and, and maybe there is a leaf out of that book in terms of like, you know, how other policy planning processes can be influenced or integrated in terms of, you know, the language like net assessment, which has been adopted in, in um, the DSR. Now, net assessment is not going to be applicable in an aid con context or anything like that, but, um, but you know, more scenario-driven planning um, and, and concrete planning processes that look to operational questions and look to the deployment of resources um, with perhaps less of a... Uh, which, which is perhaps a less of an instinct to traditional policy development right now. It's difficult, but yeah. Yeah, that's good as fun. Um, any questions from the floor? Let's start with Pete. That's a very interesting presentation. Thanks to the three of you for that. But I've come back to discussion about the whole of the nation and uh, from the point of view of the AIIA, a community facing organisation. Now, what, what really can the AIIA and other partners in that big tank uh, activist space really do? We're not the tool of statecraft, clearly, but um, what sort of you know, spheres of influence or levers can the AIIA used to play a role in that fashioning of public views on uh, international? Uh, effects. Uh, we try hard to get parliamentarians to come to our meetings, mm -hmm. but not always great success. Mm -hmm. uh, better success in getting members of the public service to come to our meetings, and that's uh, quite useful, I, I'm sure, for, for both of both parties, really. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'll just uh, throw it open, if I could, uh, to the panel to get some ideas about how we can prosecute our role. Absolutely. No, I, I think it's a fabulous one. I, I think it's at a few levels, actually. Um, so I agree entirely that part of, you know, the whole of society discussion is about educating and informing and involving the whole of society. And I think AAA over its almost 100 year history is the key Australian institution that has done that and has done that brilliantly and I think has moved wonderfully with the times um so now you know not only has the journal and the talks but also the you know, the webinars and the social media and the blog and all of the things that we do at the AIA to try to to engage society in these questions so I think that that in itself is a massive achievement um, the other thing I think AIA is a, is a vector for is direct contact with similar communities internationally. So um, when, when I was here as, as um, national director, uh, one of the things we focused a lot on was links with institutes like AIA all around the world. We did a lot of second track dialogue, visits, uh, study tours. I don't know if any of the members here have been on some of the wonderful study tours that are run. Those are all a direct way that AIIA is building these linkages. Now, I would say that is a tool of statecraft, but this is why we don't like, no one likes being called a tool. <laughs> okay, we got that. So, but it is an element of the way that we interact with the world. It is an element of how other countries view us. And I think AWIA has a, a really crucial role in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Greta. Any other questions from the floor? Yep, down the front, yep. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a touch of um, Obviously, uh, you have really looked into the Australian tools of statecraft, but Australian foreign policy doesn't exist in the vacuum, and there's many countries exercising their tools of statecraft. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the strategy really converges, and they have many of the same ideas as Australia, but we still see a lot of duplication of efforts or clashing of efforts. So do you have any ideas in terms of what can happen internally, perhaps within Australia or within other countries, that would help to exert that influence in a, a converging way? Mm -hmm. It's a really good point. <laughs> I, I was going to mention our next paper, and then I'll go over to you if that's okay. So um, our next paper uh, that we've just launched on Monday um, is actually looking at that specifically with one country, and we want to continue that process. So it looks at how Australia and France can coordinate in the Indo-Pacific. So how can we bring together our defence diplomacy development and some of the issues and barriers and also some of the potential. Um, and I think there's a lot that we can do there. Um, but can I say just 
given you're kind of coming from the Netherlands. Um, when we were looking internationally at who else is taking this sort of approach, um, we really could only find much from US, UK, Canada and the Netherlands who are at least explicitly talking about getting the Ds together. Um, I mean, the other example, of course, is countries which are coming more from a totalitarian view where it's just, I don't know, part of their mode of operations to bring all tools together. But I, I think there are some countries that are at least thinking about this and trying to work out in, you know, a, a, a liberal democratic context, how can you reasonably do that? Right it to you. So I run a think tank called the Development Intelligence Lab and we um, we ran some analysis on exactly this. We went out hunting for, <laughs> for examples of where it works. Um, can't say we had like major wins outside of UK integrated review, but a few of the things that we did find was that if you want agencies to be operating together, what you are asking is people to do more work than they're currently doing, and you are asking them to mediate their, their vested interest with others, right? So if you're asking them to do that, then you better bloody well fund them and resource them. And the examples of where you're getting better coordination would be things where there's been a deliberate funding and staffing regime set up so they're not perfect examples but you look at the UK stability fund um, you look at the countering PRC influence fund coming out of the US um, you look at the US fragility act it's a piece of legislation that mandates the state department defense and AID to operate together in certain places and report back to congress on it so I, I don't I wouldn't necessarily advocate for Australia or another country for that matter to be going down this specified funding route. But if you were to be looking to seed coordination, um, then the other finding we did have uh, is that you need to be picking areas where there's a convergence of interest between yeah. your government agencies. So things like climate, things like cyber, for example, where there's a diplomatic interest, there's a developmental interest on digital transformation and enabling tech, there's clearly a security interest when it comes to resilience and protecting privacy, security, and all the rest of it. You pick areas of convergence and momentum and you fund and resource them and you put people together, literally co-located. They seem to be some of the, I guess, the baby steps um, towards trying to get this stuff happening in practice. I think on the, on the co-location thing, I mean, the other thing that, that occurs to me, you know, that... A parallels the the comments we've both made about operational settings or crisis settings rather than kind of long term um, policy development and national convergence. Um, but also, you know, remember a colleague uh, recent a conversation with a colleague recently um, talking from the the New Zealand context and small jurisdictions are another example, right? Because you speak to to Kiwi policymakers and you go, yeah, I'm you know Prime Minister and Cabinet you just walk across the hallway because, yeah. you know, three of us cover that whole, you know, there's a small jurisdiction advantage, which is not, obviously you can't replicate to a national level in a non, you know, in a jurisdiction that, jurisdiction that is less compact, but there is the lesson about like actually just mashing the humans together. I'll take a question from online. I have a question here from HH. Uh, to what extent the role and power of the use of media, domestic and international, is being seen as an important component in shaping, um, particularly the whole of nation buy-in um, of foreign policy imperatives and strategies that are in the best interest of Australia. And so that's the role of the media. Role and yeah, role of uh, role and power of the use of media. Mm -hmm. I, I would say it's not just within Australia; it's also outside Australia as well. So I think those narratives are very important. So, yeah, a very quick link back to really the first question. Um, I think that's something that. Is kind of one of the important roles that AWIA and and peer organisations have. Um, we all know that you know the the less balanced voices are going to going to speak up. Um, so I think it's incumbent on all of the balanced voices. You know the AWIA AWIA being being an exemplar of that, and people who understand the system, who have a broad perspective. Um, media engagement is really really important um and you know i think there's a there's an instinct among parts of this community not to not to be a talking head and not to be seen as sort of a, a cheap commentator and so on but i think it's a really important role for these kind of institutions because the, the the people who have less qualms 
will okay. suck up the oxygen. Nice. Yeah. 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 Um, my sense is media is it increasing in its relevance. So you can promote media freedoms offshore through your development program, for example. Um, but I think there's probably a question for government around what its strategic communications play is. Um, you know, bureaucracies are not the best at getting across, you know, brand new social media platforms. You can see if you're a, a Twitter or a LinkedIn user, some of our ambassadors are great at it. Some are a bit awkward. Um, so I think in all seriousness, it, it would be great to see government looking at its strategic communications approach. Um, and I'd say that that needs to be thinking about how are we getting regional content here? How are we promoting international engagement domestically? Um, but also then how are we mirroring that and, and backing that in, in the region as well? Um, I know we do a lot of it. Um, but it, it seems increasingly more critical um, and not just that, but an increasing threat um, that needs to be addressed for, for people in the region around misinformation, disinformation. Um, you wanna, yeah, down the front here. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I haven't read the paper, but I work in the climate and development space for many, uh, many years. So my question, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to read the paper, but I'm just going to pick up on your climate and uh, development part. And, and uh, I, I can see, you know, given the threat of climate change, uh, and I'm, I'm now looking at a bit operational, you know, where Australia is thinking about organizing, actually, is actually probably going to uh, pledge to host COP31, and uh, thinking about engaging with the Pacific more actively. And obviously, um, so how does that, you know, particularly how does that climate change factor into this equation? Because now it's going to factor in everything in development, in security. This is, uh, and in particular, how does, uh, so I, I, for instance, don't know if Australia has decided to fund GCF again, it had stopped. So there's a second replenishment going on. Is Australia coming back to fund GCF or not? For instance, I mean, these are really operational matters. I mean, moving from the four blocks to actually what it's going to mean in practice. So I just wanted you to give a little bit of sense in terms of the practicalities of what this tools means in terms of picking up on some of these pillars. And is there room in that sense, a movement in that sense happening? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right in seeing an opportunity uh, for Australia making a bid to host COP31, let alone um, to co-host it with the Pacific Islands. And I think what that sets up is a runway for organisations like all of all of ours here um, to be thinking about what, what would it look like for climate change to be an issue across all of the elements of national power, be it from the community all the way through to our classic defence piece. I think we'll has made reference to our intelligence agency looking at national security threats coming out of climate change. I know ASPE is running a big climate project headed up by Robert Glasser. We're all working around the intersection of, of climate change, Australian di um, diplomacy and, and reputation as well. And I think um, the big thing, and I mean, we, we were just sitting um, in a meeting prior to this with a uh, former president of, of Kiribati, um, Enote Tong, um, and we were we were musing that for some reason um, Australians think of climate change as something that happens very very far away, and yet we have our own recent experience, be it bushfires, floods, people not yet back in their homes. Um, my prediction would be that issues of of climate change domestically and internationally for Australia are only going to become more central to the agenda. Um, and I think you can see the hawks, not the actual hawks, but the hawks. Um, circling around this amongst our, our defence development and diplomacy communities. So I think it's an area um, not only of national significance for us to tackle, but a really fertile area um, where you can be looking at this all tools of statecraft kind of strategy and approach. How? I don't know. There's going to be a lot of work, a lot of vested interests, a lot of pushback, um, but I would have thought that COP31 is a, is a real unifying moment that we could be pushing towards. Uh, I mean. I think two quick comments. The first is, I mean, does he completely agree? I mean, to me, that the two structural factors are, you know, that, that are shaping everything that, you know, this kind of community is thinking about. Uh, with the, it's the two C's, right? It's China's place in the region and the world that we're coming to terms with is climate change. Um, and that's going to be the reality for a long time to come. And also the intersection of the two. Um, on the Australian discussion specifically, I think on that nexus, there is a, an interesting but potentially worrying line of conversation within the debate, recognising some of those overlaps. So I don't think there's a particularly realistic chance of us 
delinking ourselves from you know, clean energy supply chains that are dominated by the PRC. Um, and we need to make sure that you know we we do not allow them to be derailed by broader geopolitical competition. Um, the second is, as you would also well appreciate, the climate change discussion is so dominated by the Southwest Pacific and the Pacific Islands. And there are good reasons for that, reasons of historical responsibility, colonialism, the genuine existential threat and so on. But, but obviously the weight of new regional impacts in population and exposure terms is in Southeast Asia. We haven't even had a genuine conversation in, in most policy circles about our relative scale um, and how we mobilize adequate finance um, as a potential conduit the finance into the region at that scale, which is just of a different order of magnitude in a place like Indonesia than it is in Kiribati. Um, so I think like centering Southeast Asia and maritime Southeast Asia in that conversation to me is one of the critical next moves. Yeah. That's probably an unsatisfying answer. Thanks, Liz. I think that's about all we have time for tonight. So I wanted to. Oh, we can sneak in one more question. You've been trying. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. We can sneak in one more question. I'm trying. We can um, also invite you to uh, to ask any more questions you may have on our panelists after the talk as well. Um, but I wanted to extend my thanks for, for being here and for your time tonight. We have some small gifts um, which we can pass along after the talk to to say uh, to give our thanks to you, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, before we go, I'll hand over to Heath, who wanted to uh, let you know what's happening here. Thanks, Mia. Our next uh, meeting will be the 12th of July, where we have uh, Professor James Cotton from the UNSW in Canberra talking about uh, the Australian legation in Shanghai in the 1930s. So we can perhaps learn some lessons from this. Hopefully we'll see you there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.